I do. Casey Bunker, why don't you go ahead and stand up? He's going to be helping me. He did a lot of help with looking through the, uh, the literature and preparing the slides and getting the experiments ready. So thanks for coming out today. Sure. Oh, yes. Um, this, this talk will also be given during, during the focus series, so it's, it's uh, sort of related to that, with the topic of America the Beautiful with both a question mark and an exclamation point. So we're going to be looking at ways in which America is great and ways in which America can be improved. The question mark implies ways it can be improved. The exclamation point implies ways that it's great. Uh, this graphic here shows the results of a Pew uh, research, or excuse me, a Pew uh, survey in which uh, United States citizens were asked uh, whether climate scientists understand very well whether climate change is occurring and whether climate scientists understand very well the causes of climate change. And you can see about a third of Americans think uh, climate scientists know what they're talking about in terms of whether it's occurring. And about a quarter of Americans think that science, climate scientists know what they're talking about when it comes to the causes of climate change. And I, I submit to you that uh, the reason why these numbers are so low is because most Americans get their information on this topic from, from politicians or from, from the news or maybe from blogs or from social media, or maybe YouTube videos. So what I'd like you to do, I'd like you to just think a little bit about where you get your information and what you know about climate change. Where do you get it from? Is it the news? Be honest with yourself. This is Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth talking about what is going to happen to Florida if the sea level rises 20 feet. This is Bill Nye claiming that sea level is going to rise 70 meters as a result of warming of the globe and expansion of water from energy going into, into the ocean. I submit to you that this problem exists because people are getting their information from the wrong place. If you want to understand climate science, you should be, as difficult as it is, looking through respected, peer-reviewed scientific articles. You can understand some of it. You can't understand all of it. I read articles. I don't always get them all. But as I read through, I'm able to understand quite a bit. And there's easy things to, to see. Right there, that's highlighted. This is published in the, in the journal Science, which is the premier scientific uh, journal in the world. And you can see that they are projecting a sea level rise of about 2 meters by 2100 under pretty extremely cir high circumstances of, of accelerated warming. But more plausible conditions lead to a total rise of about 0.8 meters. That's about 2.5 feet. So while Al Gore is correct in his statement about the melting of, of uh, Greenland and, and, the, and the ice caps, it's exaggerated. And while Bill Nye is correct that that 70 meter rise would happen if all of the sea ice melted, that is correct, that's not going to happen unless things continue the way they are going to continue for thousands of years. This is why it's important to get your information from the right spot. And as difficult as it is, this is where we ought to be getting our information from. Before you think that there's nothing to worry about, 
remember, you shouldn't be getting your information from politicians. This is the, a map of Tangier Island in Virginia, what it looks like today. And this is what it's going to look like if everything remains the same in roughly 65 years, which is in the lifetime span of some of you sitting here. And the folks on Tangier Island, 80% of them, they're, they're, they're heavy Trump supporters, and they don't think climate change is a real thing. They're going to lose their homes, no question about it. So before I get into the science, I thought I'd get into the, the consensus on this subject. You might have heard in the news, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is occurring and that humans are causing it. Even that statement's misleading. These are published articles in the scientific literature, respected scientific journals, not blogs, where surveys have been given, abstracts have been studied in the peer-reviewed literature to sort of find what is the level of agreement among climate scientists on this topic. And what they find is, as you increase the level of expertise in climate science, the amount of agreement that humans are causing the warming of the planet and associated problems increases. 97% of climate scientists agree that global warming, climate change is happening, and that we humans are the cause. We can get into the details of these studies, but I'd rather get to the science, and you should, you should recognize that we are just scratching the surface here in this uh, 45 to 50 minute talk. There's a lot that you can get into. So I've just got some slides here from this 97 hours of consensus. There's a site there. You, you ought to spend some time just looking through. They have 97 different scientists who have made claims about what's going on. And these are scientists that you're probably not going to see in the news. You're probably not going to read about them in the blogs. You're probably not going to see them in YouTube videos or when you look on social media. What you're going to see when you look on social media are contrarians, people who go against this type of, of um, consensus, mainstream science. So to begin the story, the scientific story, we've got to go all the way back. You can go ahead and get the, get the penny going. To 1827, that's where our story begins. There's a guy named Foyer. I think you know who he is, yeah? Sure. He was also a physicist. He wasn't just a mathematician. He was also, also a scientist. And he came up with this idea for how planets warm. It's, it's a really simple idea. The temperature, that's that big T there. The temperature of a planet is going to be a balance of the rate of energy into the planet and the rate of energy out. If you mess with any of those, you're going to mess with the temperature. That's basically what he said. So if I increase energy in, what do you think that's going to do to the temperature? Up it goes. If I decrease energy in, what's going to happen to the temperature? Down it goes. If I increase energy out, the rate, I should say, the rate of energy out, that's going to make the temperature drop. The planet cools off more quickly. If I slow the rate of energy out, and this is what's important for climate change, if we slow the rate of energy out, then the temperature is going to go up. And what's beautiful about this is, you, you, you know, to some of you that looks like a complicated equation. It shouldn't. That's a really simple equation. Look how simple that is. And yet, if we use that equation to look at the expected temperature of the planets, it actually makes a heck of a lot of sense. Right now, I just want you to focus on this planet here that has no atmosphere. That is the temperature that's expected based on the equation. That's the temperature of the planet. I'd say that's not too bad. That's some good agreement. Well, there was another scientist, John Tyndall, in 1861. By the way, this is the first mention of climate change in the literature. Okay. 1861, first mention of climate change. Although you probably will hear in social media that global warming was changed to climate change 
roughly in the 1970s. But nevertheless, Tyndall was a, a hiker, and he was hiking through the Alps, and he sort of got this idea that there were these glacial periods that were happening that were driving the formation of the, of the Alps that he saw. And he wondered, well, what in the world would cause the Earth to get warmer or cooler? And he, he knew of the ideas of Fourier, and he thought, well, maybe it's the gases in the atmosphere that could be causing this warming and cooling effect. And so he looked into it, and he studied some gases. And sure enough, he found that air alone didn't do real well, but these gases here, carbonic acid, nitrous oxide, that just means hydrocarbon, so there's your organic chemistry. There's some gases in the atmosphere that actually seem to cause slowing of the energy out, which causes a warming of, of the planet. Carbonic acid, when you see that, when you see that, that actually refers to uh, carbon dioxide. And Bunker's going to do a little experiment here to show that. Let's do this one here. Sorry we didn't get to the penny. But what he's got here is some dry ice, which is carbon dioxide. Okay, it's just really cold carbon dioxide. And he's going to take some of that carbon dioxide and he's going to put it into this container here, which has an acid base indicator in it. And this acid base indicator happens to be yellow in an acid. So we are going to bubble some carbon dioxide through this container. And if it turns yellow, we'll see that the reaction between carbon dioxide and water forms an acid. And this is why folks in the past called carbon dioxide carbonic acid. And look at this statement here. His experiments indicate the chief influence of warming happens to be by aqueous vapor. In other words, water vapor. So water vapor causes some warming. Every variation of water must cause a change of climate. 1861, climate change. Similar remarks would apply to carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide was linked to climate change all the way back in 1861, prior to this being a political issue. Now we can look at some of the temperatures of the other planets and gain some insight into the role of these gases on the temperature of planets. Mars has a very thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Its atmosphere is 1 100th that of the Earth's. And we see that the expected temperature is a little lower than what's actually there. No atmosphere, it's spot on. You start sticking in an atmosphere of carbon dioxide, you get some warming. Earth is 33 Kelvin, or roughly 60 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than it would be without an atmosphere. With no atmosphere, we'd be an ice cube. Venus has an atmosphere that is 100 times 90, 90 times the uh, pressure of Earth. It's thick, thick atmosphere. It's entirely carbon dioxide. 95% carbon dioxide. You can think of it as all carbon dioxide. Here's its expected temperature. Here's its actual temperature. In 1896, this is the first published uh, article that deals with the issue of human-caused global warming. 1896 long before this became a political issue. Arrhenius was noticing that when carbon-containing materials, fossil fuels are burned, carbon dioxide is produced. And he wondered, hey, what's going to happen to the, to the planet if we keep burning CO2? He studied it, and he said, look, if we double the amount of carbon dioxide, then temperatures in the planet are going to rise 5 to 6 degrees Celsius. He was off for reasons that we know about. But that's what he concluded, and he said, this is a great thing. We're going to avoid the, the ice ages. And roughly speaking, he was probably right, because the amount of CO2 that we were releasing due to the burning of fossil fuels back at that time was 30 times less than we are today. He expected about a 50% rise in 3,000 years. Nice, gentle rise.
Later on, folks decided that they better look into this issue a little more, different, uh, more deeply. And uh, Callender picked up on this idea. He showed a two degrees rise on a doubling of CO2. By the way, if you hear me use the term climate sensitivity, that means what will happen to the temperature of the climate based on a doubling of carbon dioxide. Both of these guys made some uh, errors in their, in their thinking, but nevertheless, they've provided a basis for what was to come. Uh, Ploss from Michigan State, he said the carbon dioxide theory predicts a warming trend that will continue for centuries as long as fossil fuels are burned in significant quantities. He said roughly a four Celsius degree rise in temperature with a doubling of carbon dioxide. That was in 1956. I think this statement by Ploss, who was writing in 1956, superimposed on some data that's been collected since that time are telling. If temperatures keep going up and CO2 keeps going up, it will be firmly established that carbon dioxide is a determining factor in causing, here's the words again, climate change long before this issue was politicized. What you're looking at here in the blue is oscillations of carbon dioxide as they're measured in the atmosphere. There's a rise that's associated with plants respiring in the winter when they're not undergoing photosynthesis in the northern hemisphere where most of the land is. And there's a dip that corresponds to the summertime when photosynthesis is churning and they're taking in CO2 like crazy. You're looking at the earth breathing there. You're looking at the natural variation in carbon dioxide. It's amazing to see that type of resolution. This thing that you're looking at, that large rise that you're seeing, that's the increase in carbon dioxide due to man. So when folks ask, and women as well, when folks ask, what portion of this problem is due to human emissions, you can point to this graph. That, that's the earth breathing. And look, it returns to where it was. So really, it's a wash. That's what we've done since 1955. And it's keep going up, it's, it's not stopping. see where I get my data here. By the way, I do want to mention, I was wanted to mention this earlier, but I should mention, I am not a climate scientist, so you should not trust me. I, I'm not kidding around. You should not trust me. You should dig into the scientific literature, and you should make sure that what I'm saying is correct. And if I make a mistake, you should tell me so I can correct it. Absolutely. I firmly believe that. These are the first guys to get it right. They put all the ideas together. They used computer models. They used the correct models. They had the physics correct. And they came up with a climate sensitivity bunker. I can't remember. Do you remember what it was? Was it 2 Celsius? 2 Celsius for a doubling of CO2. He's there to help me in case I forget. There's a lot of stuff going on I can't remember. What's interesting is they made a lot of predictions based on these models that they come, came up with. They, they were able to model the atmosphere using computers of the Earth atmosphere sort of like an onion. So they were able to layer the atmosphere and see different layers in their computer models. And they made a few predictions. They predicted that the water cycle, the hydrologic cycle, the evaporation of water from, from the ground and the oceans would increase. Of course, it's getting hotter, you know, you're going to get evaporation, that's going to be easier. And if you get more water in the atmosphere, it's going to dump down, it's going to dump down harder. So the water cycle is going to get a little more intense. They also predicted polar amplification, which means that the polar regions are going to warm more quickly than the lower latitudes. And they also predicted that the lower level of the atmosphere, where we live and breathe up to about 100,000 feet, that's called the troposphere, they said that's going to warm and the stratosphere way up above the troposphere, that's going to cool. These are some papers from the Proceedings of the Nas National Academy of Sciences. I just picked these. You can look and see if there's more. There are. That indicate that the water cycle is getting more intense. Satellite-based measurements 
have noted tropospheric warming, stratospheric cooling, and polar amplification. Changes in temperature in the polar regions in blue, global averages in red. Might want to pause for a second and listen to one of the climate scientists rather than me for a moment. This guy brings up this word projections. Projections are important in climate science and it's important for people to understand the difference between projections and predictions. I'm certain that climate scientists know the difference between projections and predictions. So I'm going to be talking about these things so it's important for you to know the difference as well. I'm going to make a prediction and it's a really good one. I'm going to die someday. Okay? That's a prediction. There's no conditions associated with it. I'm now going to make a projection. If I only eat fatty foods and fried foods, if I never exercise, if I smoke cigarettes and I drink alcohol, I'll die by the age of 60. That's a projection. It's based on certain conditions. And if I decide not to drink alcohol, but do all the rest, and I don't die by 60, we can't say anything about my projection. The projection is, is rendered moot. In order for a projection to be something that you consider, that projection has to match reality, the stated conditions. So as you can probably imagine, since the time of Witterald and Manaby, who got you know, the first guys to get the modeling right, you know, technology has improved since 1967 and 1975. Computer modeling has gotten better, and it continues to get better. I'm just going to show you one uh, projection. There's actually three projections on here. From 1988 by Hansen. This was published in uh, uh, Geophysical Research. And I know it's hard to see. I apologize for that. But here is a projection of glo here. Here's where they, this is 1988, so the dark line, that's the actual temperatures. Here is a projection based on exponential increase of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which was not realized. Th this projection ended up being false because folks realized uh, around this time that the release of chlorofluorocarbons was causing a hole in the ozone, so they stopped emitting them. And CFCs, are, chlorofluorocarbons, are, are horrible greenhouse gases, terrible greenhouse gases. So that, that's a good thing that we, that we stopped that. Here, this is a prediction that was based on a linear increase in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And this one here is actually a decrease. They, they modeled the decrease because they thought maybe they would start to uh, eliminate these chlorofluorocarbons. Reality ended up being somewhere in between these two, and so Dana Nussatelli graphed the average of these two versus time for Hansen's 1988 project prediction, and actually his 81 prediction is better, but his 88 prediction, you can see it's a little off here by, by 2012, and that's because he overestimated the climate sensitivity at 4.2 Celsius, Folks nowadays think it's, it should be right around three. That's the best estimate for the climate sensitivity right now. So we know why this is, why this is off. Some of it you may have seen Patrick Michaels on the news. He's a favorite of the news media to interview on climate change because the news media needs to maintain balance in their reporting which means they need to show both sides. That's not the way science works. It's just not. We don't, you know, we allow people to talk about whatever they want, but we don't come to conclusions on the basis of making sure that everyone gets equal time. Nevertheless, Pat Michaels testified to Congress on July 29th, 1998. This is a rendering of the graph that he showed to Congress, which shows scenario A, which is the projection that did not match reality. He's a climate scientist. He should know better. Either he was trying to mislead the uh, American people and Congress, or he doesn't know climate science. 
I think he knows is climate science. I suppose it's not just an either or. I imagine there's other scenarios, but certainly those two exist. This is a graphic put together by uh, uh, Nussatelli on the various projections made by various scientists. You may have seen him on PragerU. This is by a climate scientist and uh, I believe it was the 1970s. We know why that's too high. He made some erroneous uh, assumptions about sulfate aerosols. He thought they would warm the planet when they really cool. These lines you see here represent those by people who do not think that men are causing, when and women are causing climate change. Those others were the projections by folks who think it is. By the way, you should recognize that the projections that you see by the mainstream science, all of those can be found in the, in the scientific literature. The ones for the people who don't think it's happening, some of those are based on statements that they've said or blog posts because as you can imagine these folks are having trouble getting their ideas into the published scientific literature. It's called scientific censorship. We do it. We try not to let junk into the literature. It happens. Here's an argument I'm sure many of you have heard that the climate has always changed. And that is true. The climate has always changed. But what has caused the change? People have always died. I'm going to smoke cigarettes. I shouldn't. I mean, that's not going to cause my death because people have always died. So let's look at this. The climate has always changed. What has caused that change in the past? And the way folks sort of understand this is, it, this, is a, this is a beautiful, beautiful story. I absolutely love this story. They go to Greenland, they go to Antarctica, and they drill holes in the ice, meters, like 15 meters at a time. See, because what happens in Antarctica is every year, much like a tree grows a new ring every year, in Antarctica and in Greenland, a new layer of ice gets laid down every year. And that, in that layer of ice, there's little air bubbles that get trapped. And those little air bubbles that get, get trapped, they don't escape. So the, the ice that's getting layered in right now contains air from today. And that gets locked in place. And that gets, that's a little time capsule that gets changed. And we chemists are pretty good. We can look at the water in the ice and from that water, we can look at different isotope ratios of various kinds of ice, uh, uh, water. And by studying those isotopes, we can gain clues into the temperature that existed in the past. I actually got to look at one of these ice cores when I was in South Dakota this summer. I was invited to an ice, actually I invited myself to an ice core lab. I heard one of the students was doing ice core research and I lit up like a light bulb and I, and I was giving a talk in like an hour and I ended up going into the, uh, the ice core lab talking to him and I forgot about my talk. I had to rush back five minutes prior to the, to the talk. I was so enthralled in what he was showing me. So these are a bunch of ice cores that are stored. These go back hundreds of thousands of years. And I think recently they did, drilled a core, I can't remember if it was in Antarctica or Greenland, that they're able to go back 1.2 million years now and that they're starting to study that. But nevertheless, that's me pointing to a position on the ice that corresponds to 1492. So by studying that portion of the ice, you can get an idea of the temperature and the air that was present when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. is what it looks like. So this is time running backwards. Here's today. By the way, today in the scientific literature means 1950. That's important. There's some, there's some shenanigans going on by people who want to who wanna show that this stuff is wrong. They like to put the present at 1950 and, and call that today, which is what we do. But we usually don't tell people what today really means. 
that could cause some problems because you know things have advanced CO2 has risen since 1950 okay so like negative 10 would be the year 1960 anyway you can see this is carbon dioxide you can see it oscillates it goes up and down over time and it looks like it's oscillating between about 180 and 280 maybe 290 parts per million where do you think we are today it's on the graph somewhere where do you think we are anybody know you can look it up that's where we're at today we are higher in concentration of CO2 than we have been for the past 800,000 years. That's not natural. This is interesting. Remember those isotope ratios I was telling you about that tell us a little bit about the temperature? It goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. And hey, look at that. Those things match, don't they? Man, those, those rises and those falls, they sort of go up and down in concert, don't they? It's not perfect, but they do seem to track one another. It, it, it's complicated. It is complicated. There's a lot going on here. There's a dance that goes on. The Earth, as it travels around the sun over tens of thousands of years, undergoes changes in the way that it does that. They're called the Milankovitch cycles. And as the Earth, now this is over really long periods of time I'm talking about here. So as the Earth goes through these changes in the way that it, it interacts with the sun, it changes the amount of energy in, which changes the temperature. And that can cause some warming and some cooling. So here we're looking at the, diff the Milankovitch cycles here that correspond to temperature change, that correspond to greenhouse gas emissions. So what happens is the planet warms a little bit and that warming causes carbon dioxide to escape from the oceans. Gases don't dissolve in water as good when they're hot. It also causes gases like methane, which are also greenhouse gases, it causes those to escape from places like the tundra. Out it comes. And that reinforces the warming. It's an amplification. It makes it bigger than it would have been if those greenhouse gases were not there. Then that warming causes the ice caps to melt. And those ice caps are nice, bright, and white. They reflect light. So when they melt, more light comes in and gets absorbed by the dark oceans, which further causes more warming. So it's a beautiful dance that's been going on for quite some time, at least 800,000 years. Here we can see it for the past 400,000 years where this changes in orbital cycles, causes increase in CO2, causes additional warming, causes the deglaciation, and then the opposite happens. A cooling effect, everything happens in reverse. The ocean's cool, more CO2 goes in the water, you get the idea. Title in a paper, in Science, the world's premier scientific journal, has called carbon dioxide the principal control knob governing Earth's temperature. This is what climate scientists are saying about the relationship between carbon dioxide and Earth's temperature. You probably won't see this on the news. Decreases of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere have caused global, global cooling in the past in this complicated relationship. That uh, is not fully understood. Of course, it's not completely worked out, but the puzzle's coming together. Increases of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere have caused the planet to warm in the past. So why is it going to be different today? It ain't the tooth fairy. There is a warming that's occurring. What is the cause of the warming? There's a consistent story here that the climate scientists are telling us. A couple things I'd like to talk about when you, when, you, when you hear about this issue. You should recognize that, I hope you do now, that global, 
well, maybe you don't yet, but global warming is just one aspect of climate change. In, in chemistry, temperature is, is king. It drives a lot of different stuff. It tells us whether something's going to be a solid, liquid, or a gas. It tells us whether reactions go fast or slow. You affect temperature, you affect everything. You know this. Your temperature goes up one degree Fahrenheit and you notice it. You, don't, you start not to feel so well. It drives a lot of stuff in biology too, right? Of course it does. It drives a lot of stuff in science. This is another thing that you should probably recognize. And I think Professor Hogger might be able to back me up on this. Which you think is easier to predict, weather or climate? Folks like to say, man, they can't predict the weather 10 days in advance. How are they going to predict the climate 100 years from now? I've heard that argument. That argument comes from a misunderstanding of statistics. For example, I'm going to go to the casino today. I'm not. That break the concept. But let's just pretend I'm going to go to the casino today. Can you predict what I'm going to win or lose? Can you? Probably. But we're not sure. How many, well, I was going to ask, how many gone to the casino and won? Can't do that. Folks have gone to the casino and won. It's tough to tell whether they're going to win or lose. Now let me ask you this. All the casinos over the entire United States, over all the games played over an entire year, what's going to happen? Are they going to win money or are they going to lose it? And I guarantee you they know about how much they're going to win on a percentage based on how much is played. Large scale overall changes are much easier to predict than specific changes. Harder, did I say anything you disagree with? Okay. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. So, weather is like one hand of blackjack. Climate is like what's going to happen at all the casinos across the entire earth over a hundred years. We know what's going to happen. They're going to go up in money. That's what's going to happen. I can probably name five scientists that I see on TV, on the news, that talk about this. And one of them is questionable because it's Bill Nye. I don't really count him as a client. He's not a climate scientist. Okay? There have been thousands of scientists working on this problem for a long time. And I suspect that not anyone in here can think of an actual climate scientist who knows what they're talking about on this issue on the news. But I suspect that there's many of you who've seen Pat Michaels before or Richard Lindzen before on social media or on the news. You're getting your information from the wrong spot. Think a better, think a better stop here. I've gone 45 minutes. I think that's long enough. Uh, I could get into, I could get into evidence. That, well, I guess I can go a little longer. We can talk about a little evidence of climate change here. Let me just show you. I, I think some of you may have seen this video. On these are some of the effects of climate change that we're seeing. Arctic sea ice, we're losing it. This is data by NASA. You know, these are the guys who went to the moon. These guys are the reason why we believe the Earth is round, right? It's not flat. So if you want to discount this data, I put you in the category of a flat Earther. I'm sorry, I just do. That's, I, honestly, that's the way I think, if I'm being honest. What's the difference? I don't trust NASA. Hey, they're cheating. This is a little later. That's two weeks later. That's cheating. <laughs> well, they are. That's true. That is true. But I don't think two weeks is going to cause that kind of change. Let's talk about one more thing. We can get to one more thing. Uh, some experiments we can do with this. And I love doing experiments. So we'll, we'll do one more. This, this idea of ocean acidification, which doesn't get talked about a lot. So as the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases, just like this experiment here, if you put CO2 in water, you make an acid. You make carbonic acid. It's, it's very simple chemistry. And this, this 
this is going on. As we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's a law you learn about in general chemistry called Henry's Law. You may have heard about it before. If you increase the pressure of a gas over a fluid, which is what we're doing, we're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide over the oceans, that CO2 is going to dissolve into the ocean. And when you dissolve CO2 in the water, you get an acid. And what we're going we're gonna to show you here is there's this nice little thing that we, we Christians like to call fine-tuning. You know, the earth is sort of finely tuned. And there are things in the ocean that depend upon a chemical called calcium carbonate. If you don't know what that is, you probably call calcium carbonate seashells. Seashells are made of calcium carbonate and some other stuff that biology puts in there. But what Bunker's going to do here is he has a flask here with some calcium dissolved in it. And he's going to blow some carbon dioxide into the water. Go for it. And as he does so, the carbon dioxide is going to react with the calcium in the water. And it's going to form the same stuff that's in seashells, calcium carbonate. Is it getting cloudy? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Keep going. If the amount of CO2 that's getting dissolved in the water is just the right amount, you get this formation of calcium carbonate that's stable, and you got seashells, and you got oysters, and you got plankton, and all sorts of other organisms that produce the oxygen that we breathe. Okay? They also form the base of the food chain in the, in the oceans. Now we're going to repeat this experiment, but this time we're really going to punch it with carbon dioxide. So what we're going to do to do this is we're going to bubble CO2 through it with with dry ice. And that'll be able to push a bunch of carbon dioxide through the mixture a lot more quickly. So there's the formation of the calcium carbonate, just like we did before. It happened a lot quicker because we're putting CO2 in a much more quick rate. But as the carbon dioxide continues, it acidifies the water. And when the water acidifies, it dissolves the calcium carbonate. This is a problem that environmentalists and biologists are telling that we got to worry about. That's related. This is just one other effect of several, many others, that are associated with the warming of our planet and increased amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Just a few other effects. You can read about these on your own. This is my conclusion. And remember, don't trust what I'm telling you. Check me. If I've told you something wrong, show me something in the peer-reviewed scientific literature that's a respected journal so that I can fix the way I'm thinking about this particular problem. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. It is because this problem affects everything. Guys, it's our climate. You cannot escape your climate. It is involved in everything. And we are dependent upon energy to do the things that we do. The lights are on today. The lights are on because we're burning fossil fuels. Most of us who had to travel here today drove in a car and burned fossil fuels to do so. We didn't die last night from freezing because we kept our houses warm as a result of burning fossil fuels. This is an extremely complicated problem with no simple answers. And you're going to have people who want to keep us doing the things that we've done the same way in the past. Those tend to be conservative. 
and you have people who want to try to change the way that we're doing things because they think they can do it better. We tend to call those people liberals. So this problem, you know, it's, 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 it's complicated. And so I, I know I didn't answer your question specifically, but there's a lot of tendrils out there that all of us do that are dependent upon fossil fuels. And I think all of us are probably, I would say certainly aware that the energy industry in the United States of America is one of the most powerful influences on global commerce and politics in general. And so it makes sense to me that somebody who is tied to the fossil fuel industry is going to fight this.